welcome to the Board of Education mm -hmm. November 6th meeting. May I have a motion to go into closed session? Pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, I move that we move in, we meet in closed session to discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom this public body has jurisdiction to perform an administrative function and to consult with counsel. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second to move into closed session. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We'll move into closed session. Be back at 6 o'clock. Thank you. Welcome to the Queen Anne's County Board of Education November 6th meeting. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing just for a couple of minutes in uh, honor of our, our veterans. Pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much, everyone. So I need a motion to approve the agenda for today. So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the agenda for today. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Agenda is approved. I need a motion to approve the closed and open session minutes for October 9th and October 16th. So moved. Second. A motion and a second to approve the minutes from October 9th and October 16th. Mrs. Wright. Will I please confirm when I call your name? Kathy Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative. Motion carried. Okay. So the first thing is the recognition. All right. Board members, if you would join me up front. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Am I good, Mr. Strait? Yeah. All right. Very good. So we do have uh, awards recognitions for tonight. And of course, our very first recognition is for the Energizer Bunny Award. So I'm going to ask our sponsors from Bayview Financial to come forward, please. Chip Brittingham, Wayne Humphreys, Mark Humphreys. And this award recognition is given to a staff member who just keeps on going. And that staff member today is Sharon Burak. Am I saying that correctly? All right, Ms. Burak, come on down. So Ms. Burak was nominated by her principal, Ms. Jennifer Schreckengast who is here today, we're gonna to have you to come on up, from Mattapique Elementary School. Mrs. Burak is enthusiastic about everything. She brings an incredible amount of energy and a get things done attitude. She's determined to create a fun, engaging environment for her students, and she incorporates humor, movement, a growth mindset, and a safe place for students to take risks. There's no challenge Ms. Burak won't overcome, Mattapique Elementary can count on her to always find and share solutions and to consider students' needs first. So please join me in congratulating Ms. Burak. And don't leave. So we're going to ask you, aside from your principal, who you have with you tonight. Uh, I have my husband, Tony, my son, Owen, my daughter, uh, Miranda, and um, Mindy is my teammate on my fifth grade team. So please, family and friends, come on down for a photo. Please join us up front. Family and friends, don't be shy. Come, we'll, we'll take it for you, don't worry. Come on, we'll, we'll take it for you. But we'll take it for you so you can get in. Oh, that's okay. I just want to see. Oh. 
Our next award is the Queen Anne's County Public School Spirit Award. And this award is presented to an employee who personifies the spirit of education. Tonight's recipient is Sarah Peace from Mattapique Elementary School. <laughs> Mrs. Schreckengoss says Mrs. Peace takes on our PBIS program, leading the planning of each event and maintaining all of our Tier 1 interventions and supports. She's an expert in promoting positive behaviors and often supports her fellow colleagues with an out-of-the-box approach to classroom management. Mrs. Peace possesses an exceptional perception and understanding of young children and is able to demonstrate effective strategies and inspire others. Her child-first mindset is contagious and her willingness to help others is most deserving of the Spirit Award. Again, please let's congratulate our Spirit Award winner, Sarah Peace. And who do you have with you? Well, I'm fortunate to have a lot of people here with me. So I have my husband, Tyler, and my mom, Terry, is here. I have my co-teacher, Lisa. You can kind of come up with me. Yeah, come on, come on <laughs> and um, Claire Kelly, who's also a co-teacher in my classroom with me. And I have Keith Patterson, who's a second grade teacher with me on my team. Okay. Keith. <laughs> Next is our Difference Maker Award. Our Difference Maker Award is presented to someone who makes a difference in the lives of students and staff. Tonight's Different Award, Difference Award honoree is Erin Coyne from Mattapique Elementary School. <laughs> Ms. Coyne is our difference maker uh, due to the thoughtfulness she shows to all staff members and the dedication she shows to meet the needs of every student in her class. She has voluntarily taken on the responsibilities of our Sunshine Club and recognizes the birthdays and significant events of everyone on behalf of the staff. In her classroom, she compassionately diagnoses individual student needs and ensures that all children feel capable and successful. Her loving and structured classroom environment allow all students to thrive. Ms. Coyne is definitely making a difference in our students and our school. Congratulations, Ms. Coyne. And who do you have with you this evening? I have my first grade team is here. I have my co-teacher, Mary Ann Borden. I have Barb Stafford. And I have a whole bunch of other people at school that are So, here. <laughs> a whole bunch of other people, family and friends, come, come on, down. on down. Don't be shy. Come on down. And last but certainly not least, our Shining Star Award. Queen Anne's County Public Schools is extraordinarily fortunate in the quality and dedication of our employees. This award recognizes an employee who shines. Our Queen Anne's County Public Schools Shining Star recipient this month is Claire Kelly from Mattapique <laughs> Elementary. Principal Schreckengoss says there is one word Mrs. Kelly says more often than any other. Yes. 
Any request, even those far above and beyond typical duties, is <coughs> greeted with an agreeable eagerness to assist in whatever manner is necessary. Her primary focus is on student safety and ease, and her compassionate, gen gentle nature, nature calms and soothes children, while her energy and engagement promote eager compliance. Mrs. Kelly is also concerned with students' academic success, and she's able to help them in, in, with her intuitive approach to how each student learns best. Mattapique Elementary School is fortunate to have a paraprofessional so dedicated to students and so willing to take on a variety of tasks to assist those around her. We give our utmost thanks and congratulations to Ms. Kelly. Congratulations. And who do you have with you today? I have my husband, my daughter, and almost anybody else out there. <laughs> Sarah Pease, the right. Lisa Clark, <laughs> that oh, I yes. work with every day. Barb Stafford, please come up. <laughs> yep. You got your front office staff back there, too. My front office, yes. Yep. Mary. Past and present. Mary. <laughs> Mary. No, the other one. <laughs> Jen. Who's coming? I'm sorry. Anybody can come up. <laughs> Now that Mattapique Elementary School has departed. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Shrekos. Okay, next item is uh, board involvement. Um, the key thing I did, I, I've been selected to be on the uh, board of directors for MABE, and they had a retreat on Saturday and um, spent the day learning about all the aspects of MABE. Um, I will make an effort. Uh, my position on there is to represent 24 districts in the state of Maryland. Um, but I'm, uh, and I can't just zero in on Queen Anne's County, but I feel like I have an, an obligation to also represent concerns of Queen Anne's County. And I can do that for looking at the concerns of the smaller districts um, because there's a lot of big districts kind of take, take on the, a lot of the discussion and a lot of the concerns. But we have our own unique. Um, issues in our smaller districts, not just Queen Anne's County, but a lot of them on the Eastern Shore. So I hope to represent um, Queen Anne's County and the other Eastern Shore districts and the smaller districts. And, and they have actually selected folks for the Board of Directors that represent all different types of districts and all different, rep you know, different jobs people have in the districts. So I'm, I'm really honored to be able to do that, and I hope to bring back good information for the board on um, up and coming things and how we might be able to have an input to the things that um, go on throughout the state. 
that's my goal, um, to represent us in that way. So that was a full uh, day of, of uh, retreat. Um, um, and it, it, it's interesting to learn some of the concerns in the other districts, but a lot of them are similar to ours. And I think the biggest, um, <coughs> the biggest item that we're going to focus on this year in, in May is obviously is Kerwin. Kerwin is, is going to take up most of our time. I did express to them the concern that Kerwin's entire, the entire process is very complex. And as much as I even read through it, it's hard to understand all of it. I think it's important that our public and the board members understand everything about Kerwin. So I've discussed it with them and how that's a priority for all of us. And so they will, they're looking to doing, to conducting some um, regional training to, so that everyone can understand at least the basics of how Kerwin is and what our concerns are. So I will inform you all when it's going to be near, near us. I was trying to get it unique for us, but they were getting so many requests, I think they will set up some training sessions regionally. So I will let you all know that it, it would be great to have a, 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 an open discussion and a kind of a snapshot of, of what it is and what our role in it can be. So any questions on that? Or just So if you come up with thoughts that you would like me to bring forward to MABE, MABE is our main advocacy group for our school systems and our local school systems in particular. Uh, let's see, Dr. Kane. Or did any other board members? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to I'd leave you all I'd just like out. to say I uh, toured a few schools over the past a couple weeks. Impressive. I teach our staff, our support people are all well involved with the schools. I know other board members are attending some of the schools, and I think it's uh, good to get out in the community, see them, and um, they're very positive. I was very impressed. We have a diverse set of schools. I mean, there's different areas, but it's very nice to see our school system. And we have some very dedicated people. I want to thank Sid Pender for putting up with me for the first couple of schools. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry I left, left you all out. Anyone else? I just have one. It's been pretty slow for me this past month. Um, the, I attended the Southersville Middle School National Junior Honor Society induction ceremony on um, October 10th. Okay, so um, it's been a busy month. I had a couple of conferences that I attended, but we started the month with my student advisory, staff advisory, and parent advisory council meetings. They all were energized and um, ready to go. We've got some ideas for some projects for our students as well. I'm excited about that group of students. Um, we, uh, I attended the MABE conference, of course, with uh, Captain Kelly was there as well for a couple of days in the beginning of the month. Also, we had the Queen Anne's County High School um, Hall of Fame, Athletic Hall of Fame banquet at uh, Queen Anne's County High School. That was wonderful, wonderful event and recognition. Um, myself, Mr. Pender, and we had several principals participated in a crisis management training on the 7th that gave us more information about how we can continue to be uh, prepared and to better prepare. And I have to tell you that the instructor gave kudos to us because he said that, uh, you know, he's all over the country doing these professional developments and we are more prepared than uh, most schools. Not to say that, you know, everything is 100% all the time, but we are doing the right things. We're on the right path. We're training our employees and our students, and that's the right thing to do. Um, we also had our first green school certification meeting, so we are on the pathway to have all of our schools green school certified. We're looking forward to that by the end of the school year. And um, around the 10th of the month, well, actually on the 11th, the exec team and I, we had our uh, budget retreat, so we tucked ourselves away. We appreciate the support of Chesapeake College, who gave us a room to uh, get away and do all things budget related, so that was great. On the 14th, we were, I was at the um, Family Center along with Ms. Crossley, who uh, is doing a great job out there in Sudlersville to ensure that families get the support that they need with their young ones. On the 21st through the 23rd, I attended the um, Women in Leadership Consortium Conference. I had with me this year for the first two days, Ms. Pauls and Dr. McCoy. They were a part of that, and that's always, that's a good time. This is my second time attending that. 
and it gives me a lot of <coughs> strategies and, and those who attend strategies for um, how to matriculate sometimes a male-dominated um, environment in le at this level of leadership, so that is fabulous, and we get to uh, network with women from all over the country, superintendents, CEOs, and it's, it's a good time. We had the Reef Ball Project at Kent Island High School, and that was a project that was in collaboration with Chesapeake Bay Environmental Center, U.S. Uh, uh, Fish and Wildlife, and Shore Rivers, and our students, of course, um, in environmental courses at Kent, Kent Island High School. We made um, reef balls, and they are to allow wildlife, uh, aquatic life to have a retreat and also to help to protect protect the shoreline. So that was that was a good project. We also had a very successful haunted trap house. So uh, big kudos to Maggie and to um, Eric Johnson. They uh, they pulled off a great event. Big kudos also to Mr. Pender who ensured that all facilities were, were ready to go. It was widely attended by the community and they did a very good job about opioid awareness, drug awareness, and um, it was important for our community to have that event. We had the Maryland Teacher of the Year Gala on the 25th of the month at um, Martin's West, and that was a wonderful event. We celebrated uh, multiple Teachers of the Year, including our very own, Ms. Heather Eflin, and the Teacher of the Year this year for Maryland is from Anne Arundel County. On the 29th and the 30th, we uh, started our, or continued, I should say, our superintendent monitoring visit. So I've been to Kent Island Elementary, Sutlersville Middle, Mattapeak Elementary. Uh, it's November now, but we also have, for the past two days, been to Arise. We've been to Bayside Elementary. We've been to uh, Centerville um, Elementary. Where else have we been? It's been a whirlwind. Yes. Hope I didn't leave anybody out, but it's been great. So, and also the fall conference for Maryland Negotiating Service we had as well. So that's where we are. Mr. Polisky. Uh, thank you, Captain Kelly. Just to reiterate some of the things, uh, certainly I've done with the, with the superintendent. Uh, <clears throat> two things to highlight. Number one, you may have seen us on the news, a very positive coverage on ABC2 News. I attended uh, with the superintendent and Mr. Tully to our fire academy, uh, which not many people know, which is right here in our, in our backyard uh, in Queen Anne's County. And that program, which is shared with students from Kent County, Talbot County, uh, and Caroline County. And it was just great to be out with students actively engaged in in a passion for their profession. And I really can't say enough. Hopefully it was in last week's board report. You had a chance to see about a three minute clip on that. And it's just great to see kids that are passionate in a career pathway um, and, and to spark that interest. Uh, the second thing is, as Dr. Kane mentioned, we have started our superintendent monitoring visits uh, for the fall. Total uh, to date, we've been in nine schools, and I will tell you, uh, echoing that, Mr. Smith, and in, in your time uh, being in schools, is that it's what we look forward most to uh, in the school year. It gives us a chance to interact with each leadership team, uh, gives us to uh, unpack their data with them, uh, asking some pointed questions. It gives us an opportunity to interact with students, with teachers, look how the implementation of the program is going, and then each school. Uh, by the time we leave, gets a feedback report. Uh, so they know uh, from the superintendent, myself, or anybody, supervisors that attend with us, uh, they get some actionable feedback that they can use immediately to continue to make improvements. So we should be finished in the next few weeks. Each week in the board report, we'll, we'll give a summary of the schools that we've been in, uh, and then we'll revisit those schools again in February. Thank you. Thank you. So our student board member report. Mr. Driver, can we start, please? Yes, so we, at Kent Island High School, we have a busy month. We first had, last night, on the 5th, our winter sports orientation, and we're excited for the kickoff of winter sports season coming soon. Um, this Thursday, the seniors have their second class meeting, and we're going to be talking about cap and gown orders, which will start on the 14th. Um, this Friday, we have a half day, which is the end of quarter one for our students. On November 13th, Dr. Kane will be visiting, <laughs> which we're excited to have her in our classrooms. And then lastly, <coughs> later this month, um, our spring musical workshops and auditions for Wizard of Oz begin throughout a two-week period. So. Thank you. 
Miss Phillips. Okay, it's, our, it's also been pretty busy at QA. Um, October 30th, the NHS hosted a trunk or treat, which I was surprised at the turnout. A lot of people showed up. It was a great time, honestly. And then on the 4th, this Monday, we actually had our NHS inductions and senior pinnings, which is a little different than how we've been doing it. We usually did it in the spring, but this year we've moved it to the fall. And we had seven new inductees and 58 seniors pinned, which is Wonderful. amazing numbers for us. And uh, Marching Band and FFA have both returned for their trips, which glad to have them back, but I bet they um, miss where they were. <laughs> and then obviously, like Skylar was saying, we're looking forward to the end of quarter. Time has really flown by, so pretty surprised at that. Our fall sports awards night is going to be Wednesday the 13th, so it's going to be good recognizing all the hard work that our athletes have put in. And then our winter sports start Friday the 15th, which doesn't give many people a break, but we're pretty side excited to start that. And then our the last day for senior pictures to be taken is November 18th and 19th, which I know a lot of people need to take advantage of, one of them being myself. Mm -hmm. And I think we're all just looking forward to uh, Thanksgiving break to start. <laughs> and neither one of you said anything about the football game last week. <laughs> I can see why one didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm close to her. <laughs> it doesn't always work that way. I understand. <laughs> we'll just drop it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, citizen participation. Uh, for public comment, we ask all speakers, speak speakers to keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, including telephone number and address. Comments should be limited to three minutes in length. Questions or statements to the board should relate to a recent agenda item or an agenda item that is expected to appear in the future or a matter of general policy over which this board has authority. Please do not discuss items related to negotiations. Those items are to be discussed at the bargaining, bargaining table. <clears throat> this is not the proper venue to address specific students or employee personnel matters, especially those matters on legal appeal to the board. Comments about the actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comment and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or processed through the available channels. Citizen participation is not intended to be a question and answer session. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an, an appropriate staff member responds to your questions at a later date. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but asks as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you respect the board's request to refrain from naming citizens and name calling when offering your critique. Mr. Richard McNeil, please come forward. Welcome. Thank you. I guess you'll get, oh, there we go. Um, Richard McNeil, representing the uh, retired school personnel. Um, first thing, I'd like to congratulate Captain Kelly on her being uh, selected to the executive board or the directors of MAVE. Uh, I know in my experience, the uh, to be on a board from the Eastern Shore is kind of tough because you are faced with a lot of the bigger counties. And, and a lot of times when I was principal in, in the associations, um, they didn't want to necessarily hear from the small counties. Uh, I don't want to say it in that way, but the larger counties had more of a voice, it seemed like, and they sort of dominated a lot of the discussion. So hang in there you know, and represent us and all the other small districts. I know it's a challenge. Um, at, our, at our October meeting, um, through our science, silent auction, uh, we were able to raise several hundreds of dollars for our scholarship fund, and I want to thank members of the board who were here who helped participate in our members. Uh, also, for our community project, we, um, again, collected uh, what I call emergency clothes for our uh, elementary schools. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get a big bag full for all elementary schools that have kindergarten. So they were distributed this week, and, again, our members came through on that, and uh, all the schools that I went to were thrilled to have them. So, uh, you know, they, they were in the nursing department for that. Um, on November 13th, I will be attending our uh, pre-legislative updates. Uh, we meet in Annapolis and get an update in terms of any particular uh, potential bills that might be influencing or our pension or any of the retirement systems. So I'll get that update next Wednesday on the 13th. Um, mentioned the Kerwin report. 
uh, some of the information I've gotten uh, also is the same thing. It just seems kind of convoluted how they came up with some of that. I encourage the superintendent to stay on top of that. And I haven't heard at one time, I know the governor was not in favor of, of that because it, it is a fair amount of money. Um, but it's been years in the making to come to that conclusion. So uh, keep on top of that, Where Dr. Kane, if you will. Yeah. Uh, and I don't know how the impact that would have on Queen Anne's County, but it's money that is generated for uh, helping children be successful. And that's what we're, we're all about. Um, part of my other hat is I uh, monitor the life skills program for the uh, University of Colorado at Boulder, the program that we've been using. We had a site visit with the um, uh, supervisor for the Eastern uh, District uh, on Monday. Um, we visited um, Christine Webster's class and the site supervisor was real impressed with the way that went. I don't know whether you got a report uh, from her on that, but uh, while we were in there and afterwards in debriefing, she was pleased with the way it has been implemented in uh, Queen Anne's County. Um, if my numbers are correct, I think we're in our fourth year of that. So we're in the process of having students go through sixth, seventh, and eighth grade all through that, and, and uh, we're seeing good results from that. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to the Queen Anne's Band. They, they participated this past weekend up in Hershey uh, and moved from 15th to 14th and their scores went up 0.3 or something, 0.2, thank you. Um, and I know the hard work that they put into that is, is it's long hours and starts back in August as everybody knows and finishes up with that. So um, it was great to see them on that. Um, we are having our December meeting at Fisherman's End this year. Again, uh, if you're interested, our newsletter will be coming out in two weeks. We have to give them a menu selection early on. So if, you're, if you are going to attend that, I encourage you to, uh, when that newsletter comes out, uh, make sure you get your selection in. It's going to be a little different than our normal luncheons because when we eat here, it's just kind of come and enjoy the food. December what? Which December? Uh, it is uh, December 10th. If that's the second Tuesday, uh, maybe somebody could check that. It's the second Tuesday uh, in December, and we, we generally meet at 11:30 with eating around noon. So, uh, if you can make that, that would that would be good. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anyone else? Okay, we're up to our present, I mean, our presentations. So, Mr. Captain Kelly, based on the agenda timing and how far ahead we are, I, my auditors are not here yet, so could okay. we move forward with a 6.02 and then we'll catch up when they get here? Sure, if you cleared that with Mrs. Bass. <laughs> I cleared it with her. <laughs> Mrs. Bass, strategic plan goal number four, human capital. Mrs. Wright is going to pull up in a few seconds. Good evening, board, Captain Kelly, honorable members of the board. It is my distinct pleasure to present to you goal number four from my strategic plan. You can drive. It would actually that would really help me a lot if you drove. The purpose of the report is to bring you up to the data that we have been working on since I arrived. Much of it has been data driven, the decisions we make in the board and HR, it is data driven. Slide two. Okay. Oop. 
I hit it on purpose. Okay. Alicia, I should go. Yes, slide it back. That's not the second one, though. It's, you're at the back. Well, I'm at the back. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I already told you that. Okay. When I joined the team, there were proposed metrics that we were to accomplish in human resources. 10% of our newly hired staff are diverse. As a matter of fact, it's 11%. We are going to survey our newly hired employees and maybe stretch it out to everyone for satisfaction. It is important to understand how they feel about onboarding, how processing was completed for them, and in a timely fashion. We will continue to train staff on Title IX. It is a huge training, and we have secured safe schools to do the training. We have rolled it out. You may have heard. Many of the people have already completed it, and each unit will get it in stacks of two weeks, so they complete it. It's usually a series of videos. You, take the, you watch the videos, you take your test, and it comes back automatically. So staff and the rest of the human resources and executive board will know everyone who have taken it and everybody that has not. They're getting a reminder tomorrow because the first due date was November the 1st, and I have a couple of people that need to be reminded. 95% of our recruit for instructional staff are certificated in the area that they teach promote existing school-based programs like TAM, Grow Your Own. I have had an opportunity to talk to many, many seminar supervisors. If you don't know what that is, that is the person who follows you around doing your internship. They do a field experience in your sophomore year, and they do it uh, when you're a senior, and they go and they report out. Um, colleges are really distressed about the number of students that are not choosing this as a vocation. Several opportunities have presented themselves instead of education. Many of them, I talk to them and I ask them their five-year plan and they want to be Dr. Kane. They want to be a superintendent. And I said, do you realize you do have to teach? How long do I have to teach? Three years to be considered for assistant principal, three to five for a principal, but they're going to go straight to superintendent. So I did explain the, the Comar regulations for becoming a superintendent. Where did you where did you go did you I not only go, I do a lot of calling. I have spoke to Wash U. I have spoken to UMBC. I'm trying to do all the locals. I've been to Towson and it is also December and let me try to explain to you December is not the huge graduating class. It's usually people that ran into some financial difficulty or some family problems or they didn't pass the exams. So there are a semester behind. And you just came back from Penn State this year. Oh, weekend? my goodness. I was at Penn State. Excellent, excellent uh, recruitment fair. And most of them had their little buttons on. They are pre-K to fourth grade. So I said, nobody wants to teach high school. I come from high school. So they were not really wanting to do that. They want little people. And you may say, Mr. Smith, why was I in Pennsylvania? Because I already ran the numbers on how many people leave here to go to Pennsylvania and come back. Um, I will say at Towson, quite a few of their students are from Delaware. And they have done their geological stretch. And they say, oh, we'll drive. We'll drive. We'll come. So that's where they're getting their kids from, local and nationally. And 60% of the teachers in the state of Maryland are not Import. from Maryland. Mm -hmm. Imported. The majority of them are from Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Um, we've always been an import state. Right. We hire up to 10,000 teachers in a heavy year, 4,000 in a small year based on retirements where people leave. So we've always been an import state. That has not changed. That has not changed even since I started teaching. Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia. Because we as Merlin, we've always paid more money. Okay. All right. We had goals set forth before I came, and I'd like to share the update. 80% of our new hires remain after three years because they get tenure. They get tenure. And then if you want to leave, you can go to another county and request portability. 70% of the new hires remain after five years. 100% of our conditional teachers, those are people who are career changers, decided they were going to teach in after their first job, 
they have all earned their certification within the first three years of the, their teaching. And 10% of our certified positions were, were filled with minority candidates. Okay. I just put a footnote. Oh, I'm sorry, Captain Kelly. 60 under the 70% of new hires after five years. That was, mm -hmm. I know that's a key period of time yes. of losing them. We only did 60. We didn't meet our goal, but you've got it from 2014. We don't have any newer information. Well, the data goes 14, 15, 15, 16, right. 16, 17. So it's all of them compiled together, the five years going back to 14. Okay. 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 Right. And I, I'd like to share, the five-year interval is very difficult for teachers. The fifth year, they may get married. They leave. The 10th year, parents call them back from where they were imported from. And year 15, they may decide they made the wrong decision to be a teacher in the first place. Which is never a bad decision. But it, no, but it's a learning curve the first five years, what you're getting yourself into, and life changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But after that period, there's a higher, a lot higher retention. If you've been in for five years, then you're more apt to stay in. And your they have career. babies. Uh, th that really interrupts things. And but retirement too. They start to look at retirement. If they are an import person, they may go back because that state has better retirement options. Pennsylvania and New York almost pays their salary that they're making when they're retired. We don't do that. It's 40% of whatever we do when we, so they go back to their state. And it overwhelming is a family responsibility. Parents want their children to come home. But after five years, if we've retained them after five, then they're gonna, I mean, the retention rate's a lot higher. Very, yeah, they're committed. They bought a home, they, yeah, married a fellow from here, yes. But it's hard to keep them because money does not rise with their expectation that they thought they were going to make in teaching. Even though the scale is out there, but they really think that they're going to make more money. No, the scale is the scale. We can't negotiate off the scale. We can't always negotiate on the scale. <laughs> <laughs> we can only get what we get, and unfortunately, it doesn't yeah, keep all our teachers have, here. There's a lot of things, I mean, don't get me wrong, they need a fair wage. But there's a lot of things that this county and the Eastern Shore offers that's advantageous to live and raise a family too. They want to, you know, it just, it's, a, it's their personal opinion, where they want to live, where they want to work, and whether they want to navigate the Western Shore or the Eastern Shore. I talked to Washington College, going back to the question somebody asked me, yes. Washington College has 13 graduates that will be coming out, and many of them are choosing to go to Carolina County based on cost of living. There are not any apartments here, and they're choosing Carolina County, and I got that directly from the practitioner that works with the graduates, and they have about 23, they believe, for the spring, wow. that May. And I think I told you in our matrix, 10% of the vacancies for certified positions were filled, will be filled with minority candidates. And if you look, I gave you some historical data from 12 to this last hiring season. We beat our goal by 1%. Certificated employees, we have 124 males, 532 females. 87% of the teaching staff will be majority white female going forward. We have 616 white teachers. We have 21 African American teachers, 12 Latina, and seven Asian. That makes up your certified staff. Uh, many people have different certificates. Conditional, we have 11. We did hire some this year, I believe six, and five are on their second year of their conditional. They must complete it in a two-year window. We have 76 on a SPC-1. We have 29 on a SPC-2. Advanced professional, 532. 400 and, oh, excuse me, I wish we did. Uh, 46 in admin one, 36 admin two, and eight licensed. And they would be your behavior specialist, your speech pathologist, people that don't have to get a teaching certificate like we sit on from MSDE. 
substitute teachers, always a popular subject. We have 293 of them, 92 certificated, two doctorates, 33 with masters, and 70 with bachelors. Now, we have um, 227 that would only teach elementary, 161 would teach middle, and 147 that will teach high school. Now, the numbers are not going to add up to 293 because they choose to teach at different levels at different times. Minimum requirement is 48 credits or the parapro. National shortage of all teachers, substitutes or regular certificated teachers. We require college credits for substitutes, is that what you said? No, you, you do have to have 48 or the parapro. That is a test. To substitute, our policy says you need minimum requirements, 48 college credits. Oh, wow. Or the per pro. It's changing. Okay. Um, okay, staffing. Well, I got it. My mouth got so dry running my mouth. Thank you. No, I'm good. I'm almost done. <laughs> Thank you. I said 40 with me. Now I won't get so tongue-tied, I won't be dry mouth. Human capital update for two, uh, 2019. Staffing, we open filled with certificated folk. Critical shortage was world languages, Spanish, French. I don't think we teach any German. We are excited we hired our mental health coordinator staff. That is Kerwin Money. Recruitment, we advertise uh, all the certificated position on multiple platforms. We partner with colleges and universities to attract diverse students, and we utilize Title II to enhance the recruitment of diverse candidates as well. We've done training this opening of school. We did policy and regulations. We've done customer service. We've done Title IX, and recruitment training is coming up for those that would like to participate. And if you click on the employee handbook, we developed and published the employee handbook this year. Daddy, you don't have to. No. Well, that, but that's long. We don't want to go through it. I just want them to be able to click on it when they have time to peruse it. We're open to questions, problems, or concerns. I had a question. Yes. How the employee um, diversity matches our student diversity. Go back to. Okay. I would have to run that data school by school to see. I, I don't know what the minority population is in each school. Right. So we, um, we do not quite mirror. So I'm glad that you put certificated staff for, for these because while we certainly have more than 21 African American employees, these are the certificated employees. And so we, the majority of our custodial staff are African American, for example. But so that number will increase, right? Mm -hmm. But when we talk about whether or not our certificated staff mirror Match. our student enrollment, no. it does not, mm -hmm. as far as the minority student groups are concerned, it certainly does not for our Asian student groups, it does not for our Latina student groups, and it does not for our African American student groups. So we run about uh, one and a half percent for Asian. We run about seven percent for Hispanic, six, six to seven percent for Hispanic, and about five percent, five to six percent for African American. And our employee certificated employee numbers are far below that for each of those minority student groups. So, and can I add? I was going to tell her colleges themselves are on the drive for diverse students. So it's uh, fortunate for me to say to you, they're just not out there. Because there's so many more options for college graduates, they may or may not choose this. And it goes back to what Mr. Smith asked about the fifth year. They are also researching careers as they increase their collegiate ability to, to get better degrees. Um, and we're competing with the private industry. 
our superintendent group, we met, ESMIC, Eastern Shore Group, we met with, and we meet annually with UMES and with Salisbury. We met with both of those deans last week um, at the MS conference, and they are also trying to increase their efforts to recruit minority students so that they can, you know, in turn, uh, fill workforce demand for diverse students at the um, Eastern Shore districts. So there's concerted effort. Um, I believe it was, uh, it's Salisbury, I believe, that just um, came up with a new uh, program for special education to recruit mm -hmm. those students. Um, the HOPE scholarship, that, that HOPE program is coming back. Um, so there are some, mm -hmm, there are some efforts that, that are being made. So hopefully, because honestly, you know, at our superintendent meetings, you know, we go around the table. How many, you know, minority recruits did you, did you hire? Wicomico, I think, had seven, and that was the top, you know, for East, the nine Eastern Shore districts. So, yeah, I think we had two. We may have. We had two African Americans, two Latinas, one Asian, and yeah. the rest. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, which is much better than we performed. As you can see, the year before, it was a concerted effort to get those numbers up. But we're uh, recruiting in some different places and um, doing some things differently this year. So, we're working on it. And I will say we are really in dire need for counselors and parents, community, to push this vocation. We have TAM in two schools, Ken Island and Queen Anne. And I think the vocation needs to be brought before children really, really young. Um, most of us who teach and did stay a long time, we started, you know, playing school. Mm -hmm. And then it manifested itself to a reality. And it's something you really need to be committed to. I would say teaching may not be for everybody. And that's kind of a good thing for kids. But the kids that we do get are really dedicated, as Mrs. Smith alluded to. A question that yes. the, um, you said in Caroline OK, the ones that are at Washington College well, yeah, that are going Yeah, I check with Washington. Caroline, 13. Now, are, are, are any of those local Queen Anne's County kids that went to Washington College? Well, we don't, we don't track, and that's something I want to start doing um, through a tracking mechanism and a commitment letter. If we would tell young people that they had a open offer, it's hard to do in this county because you may have 40 hires altogether. We don't want to overcommit because we're not going to be granted over hires. That would be a good way to pull our local babies back um, we know that pre-K, we know that um, languages are hard to find. So if we had someone graduating from any of the high schools, especially TAM, we could give them a commitment letter. We couldn't offer tuition or anything like that. But to go through school and know you already have a job, it's a huge burden lifted off of you. You can actually do better if you don't have to worry about looking for a job. So that's a good way to track, especially the ones coming out of TAM, Number one, you got to see when they get to college, do they choose their career path? Because the first two years, they're doing prerequisites. And the third and fourth, they are practicing their craft. Many times, when they do their field experience and they, the rubber hits the road, oh, we go to a registrar and switch out. So I think if they knew that we are looking for them to come back, because they're comfortable at home. But then we have to look at where are they going to live. Every parent doesn't want their son or daughter to return. Mm -hmm. They're blessed. I mean, they're blessed if they, they've <laughs> been gone right for years. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm just saying. And some what, of us have been they don't back anyway. Yeah, you talked house. about that. What is the pull for county, uh, Caroline County, though? Um, cost of living. I'm asking because our the cost of living. Okay, just mm -hmm. that. They can get a house living. for what for cheaper yeah, than they can get in a condo. Exactly. Here. Yeah. Exactly. Because I know the commissioners are looking at ways to to bring, bring people back. Mm -hmm. They look for apartments, them. flats, many of them, and they have told me, I do not want a roommate. Ms. Bass, I've been in college, right. I had roommates, I do not want a roommate. So many of them not being on their own for real, with all of the real bills, they think they want. So they look for what they can afford for their salaries. It's an apartment here, it's a mortgage there. Yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Yep. From what I, yes. And anywhere else down the shore is cheaper too. So, very, very, uh, Thank you. Okay. very good information. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Bass. Yeah. Did you pull up the board doc? Mr. Fister. Well, from the board docs. 
Dead airspace, don't like it. Good evening. <laughs> board members uh, tonight can you hear me tonight is our um, annual presentation on the financial statements as you know by state law we're required to have an external audit um, to audit our financial statements and our activities from the prior year uh, we have with us uh, mr. Chris Hall and mr. Dan Enzer from TGM as you know uh, they're the new audit firm we went out and bid that earlier um, in the spring and they were the six, six I'm sorry successful bidders uh, and they did a wonderful job uh, this year and for the first year in many years they were able to actually through the contract we have with them go out to the schools and actually audit some of the schools and as we've talked about we will be doing that on a random basis probably hit the high schools just about every year and then all the other schools there uh, so forth and so on we did get an unqualified opinion which is the best thing that we can do and with that I will turn it over to Mr. Chris Hall to kind of walk you through some of the uh, some of, like an overview, and I have the financial statements up there, and you have them in your board docs. If there are specific questions or specific pages you need some answers to, I'm sure between the three of us we can get you the information you need. Mr. Hall. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And please, if you have questions, this is 60 pages of, in my opinion, good stuff. Um, <laughs> um, again, my name is Chris Hall. I'm a partner with the firm. Um, we do a lot of board of educations on the lower shore. Um, Dan's an audit manager in our firm and actually uh, Queen Anne's yeah, County High, High School, School uh, Plus, alumni. <laughs> <laughs> um, you actually had a couple of alumni doing your audit this year. Um, another associate from our firm, Michael Rhodes, worked with Dan on the audit. So as we came in and to the back end of that presentation, I kind of called about uh, students and coming back and you had two alumni working on your, your audit this year. Um, what year did you graduate? 2002. I think Michael was probably 2007, we were guessing, Around give there. or take. Yeah. So. so that Queen Anne's County education <laughs> served you well. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Dan's a CPA, so yep, he finished his degree, went and passed the certified public accounting exam, so Good absolutely. Job. I'm trying to remember some of the kids from your class. We'll have to talk later. <laughs> <laughs> So after the intros, and again, I'm going to skip around at 60 pages. I'm more than happy to go quickly or, or speed it up a little bit. But the most important part of what we're hired to do as an independent auditor is to give an opinion on your financial statements. And you'll see a couple reports in here that are on our letterhead. And the most important part is the opinion. And it says, in our opinion, the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects. Just like John mentioned, that, that's a clean opinion, that's an unmodified opinion, that's the highest level of assurance that any independent accounting firm can give on your financial statements. I have a question then on that. On the, the bottom of your cover letter there, yep. it said that we do not express an opinion or provide any assurance on the information, and yet... Can you point me to where you're at? The, your the, the cover letter, the bottom uh, second you're, page. It's probably talking about... Um, I'm just, I'm curious as to how you, you start out saying you can't give us an opinion. We do give but you we're an opinion. Interested in it's our... two different things. So okay. if you want to, can you highlight yep. through there? Because we're giving opinions on different things. So one more page there, right the, there. The you see opinions? I'm looking at the last. Okay. So um, in our opinion, the financial statements are fairly presented in all material respects. So the, the balance sheet, the income statement, everything through the footnotes and the required supplementary information covers that opinion. If you scroll down, 
I assume it's in the other supplementary information section. No, that was it. It was. It's yeah. right. I just don't understand what you. It seems like throughout this, you talk about how you, you can't do a. You you can give some opinions, but you can't. Okay. I still don't know. Can you point it's me to? Pay, yeah, it's the page up. Go up one. Well, and I just yeah, don't. Bottom, at the bottom, yeah. the last page, last pair, last sentence. In other matters, that's what I didn't. Okay, understand. that's on the required supplementary information. So you can see under that heading, other matter required supplementary information. So the required supplementary information, if you see, is listed in the table of contents, and it covers pages 48 to 54. Right. And and that's certain information that's required by GASB, Governmental Account Accounting Standards Board, and it's trend information, it's pensions, it's other post-employment benefits. And we're not required to give an opinion on that. It's kind of in relation to. And I'm going to get into a lot of technical accounting standards. But you're giving an opinion on the financial statements through the notes. That's what the financial statements are. Then that paragraph talks about the required supplementary information and what you opine on there. And then the paragraph after that talks about other supplementary information, the additional supplement, and what procedures we perform related to that information. So it kind of clarifies it, each part of the financial, what we do and what we don't do. Okay. After that, there's another report, and it's a report, and it's something called a yellow book report. It's required by governmental, government accounting auditing standards um, since you get federal awards. Um, and the key here, we're given an opinion on internal control over financial reporting and, and compliance, and that's also a clean opinion. It's so the highest level of assurance that you can get over internal control over financial reporting. After that, several pages on pages 8 through 16, something called management discussion and analysis. And it's exactly what it says, your management team, um, from the superintendent to the CFO, all have input in what goes in, in this. And what it's intended to do is to give a board, citizens, kind of readers of the financial statements, um, especially if you're not an accountant, you can go to certain pages in here and kind of get a snapshot of what happened during the year. It compares the current year to the prior year and explains variances. It compares the current year to the budget and explains variances and why things happen. It talks about any capital assets that we purchase. And there's a big section on um, what management thinks. Factors, it's called factors bearing on the future, whether it's Kerwin funding or anything else that is pertinent to the financial statements going forward. So it's a good place for readers of the financial statements to go and kind of get a snapshot of what's, what happened during the past fiscal year. It's more in reading than analyzing lots of spreadsheets. Exactly. After that, in the government world, we have two balance sheets. We have two income statements. Actually, we have three income statements, but page 18 is a balance sheet, which is on a, a, what I call the accrual basis of accounting, a for-profit entity. It includes your capital assets, all your buildings, your furniture and fixtures, your computer equipment, and it depreciates it. It includes all your other post-employment benefits and pensions, and it's kind of similar to what a, a for-profit entity would do. And then you also have a balance sheet on page 20, which I would consider most governments are used, used to. It's your more typical balance sheet. And you can see it by general fund <coughs> and what's called non-major governmental funds, which is your capital projects and your food service fund. And, and to me and to, to any accountant and even to the CFO, the probably the two most important line items on there are the first line, cash and cash equivalents, money you have to work with, mm -hmm. um, about $13.5 million, which if you look back to the prior year, it's almost identical. Um, and all the way at the bottom of that page, fund balance, unassigned fund balance, which is money that you have to work with on future budgets. Um, so that's your, your accumulated profit, so to speak, that you have to use for subsequent year budget, which is almost identical to the prior year also, so which tells you it was basically a break-even year, which it should be on a governmental statement. So can I ask a question? Sure. It says on here, landing instruction and process, process, progress. As I understand it, the land actually belongs to the county. What page are you, you on? Uh, I'm just, uh, I'm on page 19. I'm okay. just looking at the statement of net position. So the Board of Education actually owns land. I'm going to point you to a that, footnote. Do, yes. Am I to understand that we actually own land? I think we own it until we, we it. don't use it, then it reverts back to the county. Yes. So yes. we, 
but, but the county pays the taxes on it. There are no taxes. There's no taxes. No taxes. No tax. No tax no, okay, that's what I was looking for next. Was yeah. the tax liability on? No. Right. Okay. And there's actually a footnote on 30, page 32 that kind I had of gotten that far. Thank, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nope. Uh, nope. Just for clarification. Considering assets, I was like, oh, okay. Any other questions so far? Oh, thank you. I don't think a lot of it is like with the county. They need to do their budget. Roads, they count as an asset. Yes. Now, do you count as an asset or a liability? <laughs> I mean, when you get right down to it, it's like a building. I mean, I would consider like one of my children very expensive. Mm -hmm. Understand, but I mean, they, you know, it, it's it's a different way in, in government right. to me because you got to maintain it, you got to use it, you got to keep it going, and then you're telling me it's an asset. To me, it's a you know, that that's that's yeah. the way the government works. That's the way the government works. Okay. Exactly right. Different. And sometimes the accounting standards are kind of contradictory to common sense. Sometimes. Yep. Well, it is the government. <laughs> Your footnotes start on page 25. I'm not going to go over those page by page unless someone has read it and has some questions. They're, they're standard footnotes. They're required by um, generally accepted accounting principles. There's a lot of detail in there, like we just mentioned on property and equipment, pensions, other post-employment benefits, all places for a reader to go and to get additional information from what's on the balance sheet. I was going to fast forward kind of to page 48, which is usually the bread and butter for a government, your budget, the actual statement for, for the general fund. Um, you know, your general fund budget's pushing $100 million, 98.9 .9 million. You can see there the original budget and the final budget and the actual results. So on that 98, almost $99 million in total revenues, we were within 104,000 on actual. And on the expenditure side, we were within 200,000 on a $99 million budget. A couple questions there. Sure. Original, but then I see final and actual. Where's the final and actual change? What, what changes those numbers? The original is the original first budget you approve. Fan. The final budget is any budget amendments made during the course of the year. Okay. And then the actual is actually back today. Yep. And then actual is where we actually landed on <laughs> June 30th with revenues and expenses. So you can see the total budget is still the same, but the categories might change, like admin change, money just gets moved from admin to mid-level or instruction to special ed, et cetera, based on budget amendments during the course of the year. And just to get my clarity straight, up in the corners is variance with final budget favorable, in quotations, under favorable. Yep. The only one that was unfavorable was restricted federal funds, and I couldn't see a pattern because I see we start off with 6.7 million, that was 6.9. So it looks like we've gotten more revenue in that, but that's yeah. unfavorable. Yeah, most of the time you can probably look at any board of education and that line will probably always be a big positive. Being, the fact that it's little is probably pretty good because most time grants get budgeted based on when you get the grant, but you might not spend it. The grant might go 9-1 to August 31st, it might not end at June 30, or you might get it mid-year and it go. So there's always a timing difference, but you budget it when you get it. Would that make sense to you? Yeah. So, but you might not have spent so it. So there yet. could be a timing difference. There's on timing this money. differences when it comes to the grants, and you'll see the same thing down at the bottom. So you see the minus one thirty nine three four two there for revenues. Mm -hmm. But if you go to the last line item in expenditures, there's a positive one thirty nine three four two because grant expenditures, the revenues, and the they're cost reimbursable grants. So we spend the money, then we get it back. So the revenues and expenditures always match. So your variances there are always going to match. Student transportation. And, and we, we, we know this was coming. You know, we had 6.9, we ended up with 6.73. That, to me, is unfavorable. I mean, we, it cost us more, but it's not parenthesized. Why did, I mean, it says 1.6. Because we're, we, what we're required to do, that last column is comparing the actual results to the final budget, not to the original budget. Okay. And you see it says variance with final budget. Okay, so you're yep. looking, after we've done tr transfers and all that, Correct. then you're looking to see where we were on that. Yes. $82,000, what's that number? How much money we had left over after spending a hundred million dollars? We had ended the year with eighty-two thousand dollars left over in the bank. And that's what's asking for three hundred. Yeah, that's you know, totally and that's, and, over the cliff. And that's what's asking for three hundred thousand extra. That was on the restricted side, and I was going to point that out. If you go back up, as Chris had mentioned, uh, and also Mr. Smith, if you look at the restricted revenues, you can see we started out with six point seven and ended up at seven, and we ended at six point nine. Had we not asked for that additional appropriation, that six point nine, of course, would have exceeded the six point seven, right. and that would have shown a greater unfavorable balance, which is why we did that. Right. But yes, you're exactly right. It's just, and I, and this I asked twenty years ago, and I know I won't get the same answer because my hair went up too high. 
he said he'd spend the rest of it. It just amazes me. We have a hundred dollar, hundred million dollar budget, and we come within eighty two thousand dollars. I mean, we did a good job of spending most of our money. Oh, their money. See, the, see this. Our Everybody's money. money. <laughs> Taxpayers' money. Yeah. I mean, it just. That's why this got thinner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I got it's, none. That's anorexic. Mine it's gets really grayer. Okay. Yeah. It's just, it's just, I get fatter. Is, is that $82,000 in our fund? Is that our fund balance? A fund balance. And, and that is balance. where we start in our budget work next year with that as our fund balance? No, That's all we have? No, so we've accumulated a Over little bit. Over the that years, was the up to adding this. Okay. Number, and then we just 21. added, as okay. Mr. Hall okay. mentioned, it was almost identical. It was off by $82,000. I know it's not a lot, it's but not. It's we accrue right. and accrue, and this is this year's accruance, yep. 82. We would never want it to be zero. We certainly would never want it to be negative, and I would uh, be much more comfortable if we had a greater fund balance. Well, what did you tell us the standard is? A million? Wasn't it a million oh, it's, for um, $100,000? Two, two months budget? of operating mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would always be size. nice to be able to have that number bigger and use it for one time cost. Absolutely. Yep. Mm -hmm. We know. Have, have, well, it's we account, We've been using it in the yeah. past. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's not a recurring cost, but a one time cost that we have something we can take care of, i.e., tables in our cafeterias. Absolutely. It would be something good to. Or, or even if we had a bad winter, mm -hmm. or we had a piece of equipment that needed if to be If we had had a bad winter, the number would not be there. I mean, it would be in nope. the negative. Uh, we've be. been throwing that at our budget, the next year's budget. I'm sorry? We've been throwing that at our next year's budget. Well, it's always our next year's budget because we, we always I ask mean, for maintenance of effort. We used that last year. We've used 234000 right. of our budget. It's in our current budget. So the last two years, we've used 234000 of our fund balance. Our fund balance. Right. Yes. So... Everything being the same, we would have using 234 and only increasing it by 82. You can see uh -huh. the balance would go down eventually. But again, fund balance is only to be used for one-time expenditures, in my opinion. In everybody's opinion. Not a good way to pay for salaries. No. Mm -mm. No. Mm -mm. no salaries continue. Yeah. One-time items no. should be just that. One-time mm -hmm. items. So, Mr. Pender, is that going to buy a door? Couple. We always talk or, about how we have to replace doors. Or it will be used to fund 21's budget as well. We'll go forward and we'll have those yeah. discussions. Well, it's already going to be funded. It's already that because at, at 92, we didn't spend it. They're giving it because we get the same or more every year. The maintenance effort. So we're getting that back. The, 90, the 82 is a leftover from this year that should be a one time, should not go to fund our budget. Well, no, he was just saying if we had to use it for something in the budget. Yeah, if we had to use it for one-time cost one within cost. next year's budget, we could certainly yeah. use that for that. We still have cap we still have capital improvements that haven't been done that we couldn't fund. Understand. Any other questions on the general fund? Now I'm gonna kinda skip forward probably to the last two pages of your other operations you have. Page fifty nine is your food service operation. And you can see there if you just go to the bottom number, it has basically break even black to the $9,500 on a $2.5 million food service operation. On page 60, John mentioned the schools. Can I, can I just yep, reiterate sure. real quick? Absolutely. So basically, between us and Sodexo, we just broke even. Mm -hmm. About break even. Some of the residual we get back pays for, as you can see, salaries and wages. We have a, a half time. And we pay for equipment. Charge the food service yes. for refrigeration and stuff. So, so, yes, we broke even. Okay. And that's what we're saying. I mean, that's yeah. Yeah. contract services. That should, yeah. should be. Yep. About where it should and be. With this arrangement, yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can we go back to page 53? Sure. Bottom. Maybe you can just explain how this will affect us and the assumptions you made. Inflation assumptions going from 2.65 down to 2.6. Okay. And then general, and I guess 3.15 to 3.5 for wage, or not wage, is that? So we're figuring it's, it's not going to be as, inflation's not going to be as bad and wages aren't going to go up as much. Is that what you're assuming? That's not what I'm assuming. That's what an actuary is assuming. <laughs> on, the, on what we've done? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I can't, we as auditors can't do that. You have to get an actuary that does both your other post-employment benefits and your pensions, because um, we can't audit our own work. They come up with those numbers, and then we test it and audit it. So And, look, and, and yep. make sure it's fit in the metric or whatever. Correct, yeah. okay. And, and you, you have no idea what they base that on? They just base that on 
economy Histo and economy, historical factors, trends. Mm -hmm. Yep. So this is the same for everybody? No, this is no, just no. for us. This is Bolton Partners. Yep. Because this is Bolton Partners. Does our, our OPEB actuarial services? Oh, yeah, this okay. particular part's on pensions, you know. Um, and that's because of the age of the people, right? Mm -hmm. Pos so that, possibly. That's, a, that's another person's put those numbers, or another firm's put that together. Correct. So it looks like in that area, we're trending in a positive way as far as expenditures. Not, I mean, it's yeah. minor, but at least it's not going the wrong yeah. way. Mm -hmm. Well, the investment rate isn't, though. The investment rate's going down. No. I mean, it's a give and take. Mm hmm. And then you also have factors in Note 3, which are the other post-employment benefits, which is what John was mentioned. Bolton Partners is the actuary there. They come up with inflation factors, health care trend rates, ages, yeah. age of the workforce, actives, inactives, yeah. um, and then they factor all that in. Number of retirees. And yeah. Yeah. Yep. Demographics. That Where they are. Yep. Mm -hmm. And, and we're, probably, we're probably standard or average to what most school systems are. I mean, we're not. Now, the biggest, the biggest factor in there normally is if someone, if a entity has accumulated funds, started putting money away, that's irrevocable, then you can use a higher rate of return on investments. If you don't have any money set aside, they make you use a 20-year general obligation bond rate, which is 2 point something percent. Right. Whereas if someone's in a good, they started setting money aside, then they can use whatever normal rate of return would be over a 10 or 20-year period. Okay. So that's a big factor when an actuary does that calculation. And we are allowed to do that. Yeah, well, we talked about it. Right. We've talked about it before. Mm -hmm. Any other questions there before I skip to the last page? Page 60 is a snapshot of your schools. And I think John started out by looking at the schools. And we, yeah. we actually do test work there. I think it's very important. Um, you have million and a half dollars going through your schools um, all the schools you can see all the schools listed there they have all their own operations going on um, there's a lot of money goes through there you know you can look at them individually and it might not seem like it but you put them all together and it's important and to us as auditors to do test work there so John agreed we, we do them on a sample basis um, we test expenditures there we test receipts there um, and I just think that's very important in any school district because um, a lot of times they're decentralized. There's oversight from here, but they're kind of doing their own thing with principals and bookkeepers. I think it's important to have that oversight and, and auditors looking at that. And, and we do that on all our school boards, actually. John, and in the report here, you've indicated that that's where the problems exist. Yeah, in your audit communication, yes. Yeah. So some of the things was, you know, in the documentation aspect of, you know, making sure we just tighten the ship up a little bit yeah. on, on process. And are we doing that? I know that was brought up last year. Yeah, well, this is the first year we had an audited opinion on that. Correct, but it was right. brought up and the money. So the legislative audit really didn't go out and talk to the, on the school side. It was more central office side, so we've tightened that up. And now with a revision forthcoming probably in the spring of the school accounting manual, we've had conversations with the principals. Uh, this exactly was shared with principals at the last ANS meeting. Um, and then um, we will probably do some periodic checks on our own. And then again, resample maybe some of the same schools um, and also definitely look for problems that are continuing after the team has been informed of what some of these issues are. And continuing to offer some um, professional learning with yes. regard yeah. to their yeah, I was going to say, are we helping them with a, yes. a standard way to do these things? Yeah. We, had a, we had a training last October. We weren't able to do it this October. We plan on doing one in the spring for the financial secretaries. And we have uh, in our office of uh, financial secretary who transported from the school to our office, so there's excellent support there uh, for any of the school board keepers that need to call in. So we are providing the training and the support. Help me out with what goes into additional revenues. What types of funds are those? So those are your fundraisers, your class field trips. It's any dollars that the school is taking in and it's putting in their own school yeah. checking class account. Class trips, yearbooks, fundraisers, gotcha. athletic events, mm -hmm. gate receipts. Gate receipts. Right. Okay. So, from my seeing, Ken Island is a lot more active than Queen Anne's County. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. What's a, it's, it's I mean, a there's huge more money difference. going through. Yeah. Yeah. More money going yeah, more money going through. through. It's the money and going both schools through. are about the same size. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. But I see a big dis I mean, I, I can't say the elementary schools because I don't know all the... I know Churchill's a smaller one and stuff like that. Yeah, there's, a, there's a lot of difference. I mean, the, the drama club alone pulls in a lot of money there. They go through a lot of money. 
there's more clubs. Um, the sports. The boosters give the more. The boosters give more. I mean, it's band and sports. Yeah. But is the booster money included in this? Probably, if they give boosters. It to the school. At Penn Island, the, the funds school. run through the school yes. where they do not at Queen Anne's, or they hadn't it as of this. They okay. had not. They so, had not. But they are going to now. I believe. Because otherwise, there's no. So these numbers. Yeah, because at Ken are, Island, they may, was decided years ago that they needed to run it through the school. Yes. yes. Right. As long as the band too, because when I was president of the band boosters, that following year after uh, they started running it through the school. Yeah, I think that's what you're seeing here is probably. Yes. The majority of more than likely. So these are boosters and fundraisers majority, not the board funding certain no. schools. No, this has nothing this to do with anything the board funds. funds. Trying to make it straight yep. to the public because yep. when somebody sees this, it looks like a disproportional right. thing. Right. Yeah. 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 I just want to make no, it clear. The board funds for the schools is in your first set. This is just what they fund on the yes. side. Fundraisers and, and each school has it separately. Yes. So right. it yeah. counts. Right. Okay. So we are we are gonna the, we are the telling school. them they're gonna run their money. Queen I, and is gonna run their money through the school. I'm we have to let them have that. That, that we were looking apples and apples on all this stuff. I'm concerned that this is hard for that reason. Okay. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. I was gonna talk about the audit communications, but you already skipped there, so <laughs> I think we're yeah, good. Well, we, we get it. <laughs> Um, other than the comments on the schools, that's a clean audit communications. Just for your reference, you know, if, if there was any other consultations, if we had any disagreements on how to record something, if there was adjustments we proposed that they didn't agree with, I would have to report all that to you, and that would be in here. So none of those situations arose. So that's a that's a clean audit communication. But if anything happened like that, we're required to report that to you in this letter, just for your. Reference. So what letter do you send over to the state? The state gets the financial report. Okay. And they actually get the comment section okay. in the back. Yep. And do you have any recommendations for our finance office? It's all in there? All okay. in there. Yep. And it, not only has the board provided these reports, obviously the statements are available on our website. Um, we send uh, five copies down the state legislature. MSDE gets two copies, so it's it's widely dis distributed. And all of these were submitted. Yep, on time. Timely. Yes, which I think you That's, mentioned to start with. Yeah. So, but just okay. to yeah. reinforce required that to have them, you know, up there by September 30th, and it yeah. is a time crunch. It's quick it, it is very quick turnaround. Yeah. Um, basically, we start. Um, August 1st, because you know, we have end of the year stuff we run through, so, so from August 1st to September 30th, that's when all this work was compiled. Okay. It's quick. I mean, it starts, we start this process in May or June doing compliance testing, internal control testing. July, August, we do some of your school testing, and then we come back in September to do the general fund, the food service, do our testing to meet this September deadline. All the school boards are required by September 30, but just for reference, like all the county governments in the state, their due date's November 1st. They get an extra month. School boards, and they can have extensions. Um, school boards, no extensions. Do September 30 or nasty grams start coming to you folks sitting up there. Mm. So, very important to get that on time, which it was. So, but in your professional opinion, everything is? Yes, yes ma'am. Copacetic. Well then, Mr. Fister. Thank you. Hey. And kudos to the team. Yes, um, thank you. I don't absolutely. mean to knock you out, but that's and my staff a, does a, a great job during that time. It is a time crunch, you know. You know, we don't get off in the summer basically. So, and if, a lot of it is related to this. So, yeah. kudos to my team yeah. for uh, putting yeah. together. John this and his well. team, they got to do all the work that they normally do, and answer all our questions and get everything we need to. So it's it's double duty for them in the summertime. So, but what I would like for next year though is instead of just spot checking I mean we do need to do some on this particular thing with the schools we do need to check on different kinds of schools but I'd like to go back to some of the ones you did this year sure. to see if they've made the recommended yep. improvements okay. that at least a footnote if they're not if we're not mixing apples and apples and we got apples and oranges or somebody's not reporting at least we put an asterisk around what school is not reporting all its you know I don't know if you can do that maybe John would know yeah. that 
Yeah, and again, what you found was not a matter of not reporting something. It was more along just, again, the procedural. Yeah. Right. How Document, deposit should be a little bit more timely. You know, they shouldn't be in somebody's desk drawer. Or if, if somebody's doing a transfer, the principal should certainly sign off of that. If, I, if I'm a little short on my sixth grade field trip money and I need a little bit of money in my fifth and we transfer because the, it's the end of the year, principal should be transfer should be signing off on that. It's yeah. procedural. There's there's, there's no right. grievous errors no. here, just no. to be no, clear. Yeah. Yeah. More documentation and documentation and process. Processes. Processes. Correct. And, and in part of our legislative audit problems, we've corrected all the that accounting errors that were a part of that. Okay. It's me. Yeah, but we're not a, a, accusing them, but but there's areas here where people can cheat. And that's what you worry about because not every, you know, and I've seen that in the past. That's that's why we are looking at our processes and okay. tightening okay. up right. processes. Okay. And that's exactly why we brought these gentlemen in to do the school audits. Okay. Thank you all. Right. Thanks, thanks very, very much. much. Thanks, thanks for to the finance and team. And thanks for the back and forth. I, I appreciate the questions. It's good. I like for a board to get involved and ask well, questions. You have it's two board members that have been around for quite a number of years and a county commissioner, past board member. So you know. Yep. No, that's that's excellent. Need to keep asking. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. I appreciate it. Thanks for your leadership, Mr. Fister. Yes, Thanks, great and job. And to your team. Thank you. Okay, that was a lot to absorb, so we will take a 10-minute break. 7.30, be back, please. Closing date. Oh. Okay, welcome back. Um, the, uh, that particular uh, presentation we had on the financial uh, audit, that there's really nothing to approve, um, but it's more like an acceptance into the record. So I need a motion to accept the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County financial report for the period ending June 30th, 2019, as presented. As so, presented in this board meeting. Pardon? As just presented in this board meeting. Just presented in this board meeting. So moved. Meeting. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second to accept the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County financial report for the period ending June 30th, 2019, as just presented by the financial TGM group. This is right. Board members, can you just follow your name? Ms. Cole, Kathy Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five of the affirmative. Motion carried. Thank you. Thank you, board members. Okay, and the next one is the calendar. <laughs> so as uh, Mrs. Bass and Mrs. Forbes comes forward, uh, I'd just like to thank them before they get started for um, their leadership in pulling our team together to our calendar committee to work together to come up with um, <laughs> Some proposals for you to consider tonight, also to Mr. Fister for ensuring that our survey got posted. There's so many people that uh, teamwork, teamwork, teamwork makes a dream work. So I just want to thank you ahead of time. So it is on you, Ms. Forbes and Mrs. Bass. Thank you, Dr. Kane. Captain Kelly and the board members, we did some background for you, for any new members and the student members. Um, May 1st of this year, the 2021 calendar was approved with a pre-Labor Day start, Monday, August 31st, 2019, the last day being Friday, June 11th, 2009, well, 2020. Re uh, and we had a request from external stakeholders to look at the calendar again, so we did that. Committee members convened 1819 and 1920, and surveys were administered April of 2019, and we finished one last week, November 2019. It was open. We had 1,489 responses almost automatically. I mean, they were coming in so fast and furious, we couldn't keep up with them. Uh, John would send us actually updates every five minutes. So I said, thank you, John. It was very well received. And so if you actually look at the results of the survey, um, it closed yesterday and it's very close um, when you look at, <laughs> I know it's, it's difficult. <laughs> um, so the question was, should we leave the 20, 2021 calendar as is. Wow. 
the approved version and it, it's just about nearly split evenly. Um, okay, uh, it was a, a similar question, revise the 2020, 2020 2021 <laughs> calendar, very similar. Um, we did wanna note that in the survey at the time when we did publish it, it did list um, June, 7, June 16th as the potential last day, but as we continue to get input from stakeholder groups, those days in the calendar versions you will see soon actually ended up being June 17th and June 21st. So just wanted to reference that. Um, so again, very similar data. And then this question was really uh, with the intent for future planning as we look forward and move ahead you know, in general, what is your preference? And this survey went out to all, all community members, parents, different stakeholder groups, anyone could participate. And you can see that 53.3% uh, preferred that school starts after Labor Day, um, future planning, 39% before, and then you had about a little over 7% that really don't have a preference. Okay, and then we move back, jumping back in time to April. Um, so wanted to share this because I know that this survey data was considered and looked at by the calendar committee last year. Um, before us. Before us, yeah. yeah. Before so us. Mrs. Bass and I were not here to be a member of that committee since we are both new to the county. Um, but we did speak to members of the calendar committee who were part of that process last year to gather some information. So that survey last year, there were 1,695 respons responses received. So also a very high number of responses. And the results from that survey, you know, almost 67% preferred that that school started after Labor Day. 28% um, before Labor Day, and then again, just about 5% not having a preference. So that was from last spring. But when they, when they had that, they didn't, when they said they wanted after Labor Day, they didn't know how long they would be going to do. Right, that, yeah, absolutely mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Absolutely right. That's true. And many, yesterday we, oops, excuse me. How many did you me. have the, the survey we just took? How many? 1489. Okay. 1489. Thank you. Okay. So it's not that much smaller than this. 200. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and this survey, I think, was only open, uh, was open up a little bit less time than the one we did in April. Yeah. Okay. okay. We reviewed the calendars looking at starting end dates. And we have several versions that you, you will get an opportunity to look at. Um, when I came on board and they said join the calendar committee, I reflected back to um, some concerns when I wore different hats. And we asked our principals, I just needed to be validated, that the longer we go, the absenteeism rate will go up because when parents decide they're going on vacation or and kids decide, we don't like to say that, but they decide. So when we turn in our numbers for absenteeism to MSDE, it's going to reflect against our attendance rating. Um, we're gonna talk to you about the testing window. Uh, the uh, AP exams are assigned by Educational Testing Service, the college board. That window is the window they give us. So the later we close, it does impact instructional time for those children to pass the AP exam. Wait, go over that again. Okay. I lost it. Sure. Okay. So um, I'll actually jump to the next slide. slide. Okay. Um, because the There's calendar. No reflection on the AP exam students because where this calendar rides, it's the same amount of days before the AP exam. So they're not impacted in any way. Well, the AP windows and then the MCAP windows are set. So if the Correct. first day of school is later, so that MCAP window and the AP window are set. Okay. So if you start the year five days earlier and say we go five days later by the end, um, and there might be a little bit of wiggle room of about one or two days, then it just impacts instructional time. The most um, profound group of students that probably are mostly impacted are the students who take the fall block of the high school testing for MCAP. So that window just for an example um, off the top of my head. Okay, I can see that. I was thinking about the spring dates. They still have the same instructional yeah. time for the spring dates. They don't, not if, if there's more days after If it's the a AP full exam. year one, if it's just a semester one, semester AP, I mean, they have the same amount of time. It, it does depend um, on, on when they're taking the course. Um, right. But yes. if the semester started earlier, they might have that. It's, you know, and so for the different tests for the, the fall block, um, 
So for example, this year, just to give some context, so MSDE sets like all of the MCAP testing windows. And so for the fall block, currently for this year, just for context, it's December 16th through February 7th. And we have flexibility within that window to assess students when we feel is best for our students. And that includes a lot of the assessments that are the high school graduation. And so that was something that the calendar committee brought up to us um, was just, and, and they shared with us um, just for some history that that was one of the pieces they discussed last year as well when they did decide to do the pre-Labor Day start really just because this one year Labor Day is so late. It's as late as it can be. Um, Correct. And so those were some considerations they discussed and also that played into this year. Mm -hmm. I also didn't get that. Okay, it starts later. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, then that means that the semester is going to go toward the middle or toward the, well, now it goes to the end of January. Mm -hmm. So it makes it later in January and up to February. February. Right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it moves it up. You're exactly right, yeah. So their finals and all that are going to be clear up in toward February. Mm -hmm. Everything will be shifted. Yeah. Taking into consideration the recommendations that we heard from the calendar committee with the approved calendar, it allows for more flexibility for the end of the year and the event planning for inclement weather because we cannot predict that. We can only build in the snow days that we have. We've already discussed AP. Travel days. Travel days before Christmas, well, before any holiday, the winter break, the spring break, Thanksgiving. For the approved calendar, people have already set their holiday travel, holiday get together, and they're not going to want to change their plans, especially if they're flying or riding a train or however they're going to get there. We know that the attendance rates will change because parents will take their children out. And on the other hand, the adults will not come to work if they have travel plans, which causes a substitute problem because we will not be able to get substitutes to cover those classes because they have made travel plans based on what was approved. Um, families and staff, um, they don't want to lose money. They don't want to lose money. So th hence, they'll take off. We're, talk, we're not talking about this year. No. We're talking about next year. 2021, 2021 that was approved. Yeah, a lot of people already made plans, not for this year, but next year. Cruise people, they pay 18 months out, so they can pay 18 months. They're not going to lose that money. They do. Some 18 months out, but there's a lot of refund time and stuff to, but, to but the That's not in our... That's not yeah. our purview. Yeah, well, it's, it's not, but we're going to use that as a, a reasoning to move the calendar. Well, I think it's, it's, we okay. got to have facts. Well, I, I just, but based on the, the, com, the calendar committee, they were not in favor of the Wednesday before <coughs> Correct. Uh, Thanksgiving or the they, Wednesday before the Christmas Correct. Holiday. They would like to keep those days, and they call them travel days. Are you going to go over the two alternates? Is that they what we're doing next? They want to know. Exactly. They want to look at the alternate calendars. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't we open those up? So we have the approved calendar. And then, actually, let me go back to here. It's probably the easiest way to open Yeah, it. it's the last. Yeah. Uh, let's look at version one. Okay. Version one. Version one. Yeah. So this version one. Um, if it's okay, I'll just kind of talk through the calendar. So this allows five days, which is typical in August for new teacher orientation, and then, and then there are five professional development days for teachers before the school year starts. First day of school on the 8th. Um, there is a professional development day for teachers on October 16th. And then this calendar allows, essentially the holidays in the version one calendar are the minimum required number of holidays required by Comar. So this calendar captures, so there's, n there are no more holidays that can be changed on this calendar. So something you might notice is that that Wednesday before the Thanksgiving break is now a school day. Um, typically it's considered a travel day. It's not required to be a holiday, but traditionally it has been. Um, the <coughs> winter break, which I believe is actually the same as the approved calendar starts on the 24th of December. Yes. And then this carries that last day of school until the 17th. You can see um, over here where the semesters fall um, and the quarters and the trimesters. So I think it's easy for us to understand what's 
different than mm -hmm. what we have on the approved calendar. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking at October, there's a October to Sixth. November 2nd, there's no, there's no break. I mean, is that what they did? They took out for for staff. There is not. Um, there's, but there's day. there's a professional day October for teachers 16th. on the 16th. That's correct. Yeah, October. So students will attend from. Um, they'll get the break on the 16th, and then staff's first kind of break will be um, November 3rd, which is election day, okay. and that's a required holiday. So this version one is basically the same calendar that we have with the exception of the travel days are, are, are noted here. So there would be school on December 20, I mean, November the 25th and December 23rd. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's correct. And, and that end of school date of June 17th. And everything else is basically the same, only it just shifts the, some of the dates around like quarters and semesters <coughs> depending. Well, we already did not have school on the 23rd. Calendar. Okay. Version yeah. one starts after Labor, and then we'll put, they'll be going. The teachers will be going through the seventeenth of June. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Teachers and students will be going through the seventeenth. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Whereas version two, we haven't discussed, but it, they go, they go past the seventeenth. They go past the tw to the twenty-first. Mm -hmm. yeah. That only gives you one day until you fall into the waiver issue with the board. Well, state it, board. it the also state board has requirements after the 22nd. You only give yourself one day. If we end up with seven snow days with that calendar, we have a whole lot of things we have to request. Well, I look at yeah, look. List. I look at come back just for one day after you're already in June to come back just for a Monday. To me, mm -hmm. would be we were already we did that. We did that. That looks like a waste. Yeah. We were already we did, doing we that. Did that. Back. Mm -hmm. I know, but on this one, it's just yeah, no, but it, we, we might have had it in the past. I understand, but yes. try not to. So do you want to just walk through the version, version two, two calendar? Yeah, yeah so. so version two, I have it pulled up here. So uh, similarly to what was just discussed, so the travel day for November is now a holiday, as is December 23rd. Um, and then that pushes the year until Monday the 21st. And that's really the, the only major differences. And that allows, again, for that post-Labor Day start. Mm -hmm. So you basically added the 25th. Of November, the Wednesday. 25th, uh, yes, 25th of November and, and 23rd, 23rd of December. Of December. Mm -hmm. yeah. We already had that. Which pushes that we whole last. the 23rd. Mm -hmm. The whole last week of January gets pushed to the first week of February. Mm -hmm. But we don't, the approved calendar, we don't have the 23rd as an off day. No. Some, so this would make, give us another off day. But again, if we have one extra snow day, we have to go to the state board for approval to go beyond the 22nd. That's a version two. And all of these That's have version four, two. four built in snow days? All, all four, yes, four. Four, four are built in to every calendar. So every calendar has four inclement days built in. Well, I mean, the, the, the bottom line is there's going to be some, somebody's not going to be happy no matter what we do. Right. Because you've got 180 days for students, 189 days, nine more days for teacher and mm -hmm. service days. Mm -hmm. the idea of working in the evenings on Saturday is not going to fly. I mean, that's the only other way to get more days in this thing, right. or take a few days out take before away, after yeah. holidays. Yeah. If we're going to try to start after Labor Day, I mean, it's there's only so many days in a month. Correct. How are the now? Explain to me the AP now. Please go back if we used, do we have say, version days? one. Sure. You know, mm -hmm. I don't care if either one. Yes. Version one, take version one. So. How does that affect the AP students? So it's probably actually. In the spring, I'm looking at spring. Right? Yeah, in the springtime. So if you go to the approved calendar, the second semester starts on, sorry, middle and high. February 3rd. February, thank you, yeah. Oh, actually, you know what? I think on the current approved calendar, I think I'm jumping back. I think it's actually, is it January 28th? January 26th and 27th right. is closed for professional development. Yeah, so it's after those professional development days. So the second semester on the current approved calendar starts in January 28th. For, so for students for that second semester courses, um, typically AP, it's the second and third week of May. So for example, this year, it's um, May 4th through the 8th and May 11th through the 15th. So the semester starting earlier allows students to have more instructional time 
prior to AP testing. So if the semester starts later, then they won't receive those instructional days because that AP window is set by College Board, um, and we don't have any flexibility with that. So that did come four up. Four days. They have four. They miss mm -hmm. four. They, the, the, they it's get a four more days of instruction mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. well, actually, because we have four. That's, that's correct. Yeah. The twenty eighth to the February third, right? And we don't have to pick either of the versions, correct? We can choose if we are a unanimous board and the vote comes out that way to keep it the way it is. It doesn't have to be unanimous. That's our choice. Maybe it doesn't majority. have to be right. a version. It could be the original stance. Okay. Right. So that's what we that's we presented the original approved calendar because that is a pre start, but we've drafted two post starts for you for your right. choice. We got we got option version one. One is say as it is version. No. Version yeah. one is a one change. Is version two is a change. As version as one's is. a change. Version two is or status quo as we are today. Right. What we've already right. approved. So well, what, I, what I'd like to do is just go around with each person and see what you think individually you think. Um, be aware that the, the commissioners did send us a letter recommending that we just do it, af um, do it after Labor Day. Um, their, uh, their request, and you all got a copy of the letter, is to, um, they believe that the public wanted us to do it a after Labor Day. And that was probably based on the information we had from the first survey we had. This is before the public realized how late it was going to go. Um, it, into this into the uh, summer and so I, we do need to take that in consideration though because can we it, see that were, slide it, again the survey sure. results mm -hmm. yeah absolutely they, they think that's important and I think we need to consider that part of our decision process but I'm also interested in what everybody else thinks on the technicalities of changing or not so does anyone have anything they'd like to propose here well, I, I, I think it's wholly our decision um, I, I respect the commissioners, but they're not the educational people deciding this. But in saying that, I've always been a fan of starting after Labor Day, and to me, version one, to me, looks like the, I don't like version two only because that a Monday after it's into a whole nother week. I don't like going in June. I would love to be able to discuss some other options, but they're not on the table as far as trying to pick up some days during the year, but nobody wants to work on a Saturday. Um, no. I, I would, I, my, my opinion would be version one. Michelle? I am for sticking with the approved calendar that we already voted on. The free labor day holiday, not a start date. Well, I have been contacted by a lot of my supporters, and I'm going to follow their request, just as I did for the turf fields, regardless of how I feel. And that is to stick with the current calendar. And I'm very delighted to see that it is as close as it is. September 8th is way too late to start a school. And June 22nd or beyond is way too late to still be in school. So I'm sticking with the original calendar. And that's what my constituents asked me to do. Amy, you have your input. I've got a mixed bag because I've had everybody ask me to start after Labor Day. And I am not a fan of being having kids in school past June 17th, I can tell you that. Or perhaps the 22nd. Mm -hmm. Think about that. Yeah. That's but, terrible. But, well, that being said, um, this is the latest time that this school would ever ha have to be open. I mean, the latest time, it would, yeah, after September 7th. Right. And it is only one time. So I, I, I am in favor of sticking with the already approved calendar. Well, my Next thought, year is a different yeah. bag. I mean, a year after that is a different bag because it, then it <coughs> changes. It was a, I, I'm interested in how having, knowing children involved in AP classes that they need all the instruction they can get. And I'm concerned that so late they'll lose out, and they, losing out on those four days of instruction is really yes. <coughs> affects will affect their AP scores. I have no doubt about it. Um, and I agree 
with Mr. Smith that our job is to do what's best for the students. And I've always been a proponent <coughs> of once Memorial Day has passed, you're losing the interest of the students. And it, you gotta be a, a real, real imaginative teacher to keep them engaged and to keep them engaged all the way to June 21st would be, would not be good for the, for the students. Um, you're shaking your head, it makes me think about, well, I would like input from our students too. We haven't done that. You're senior, so yeah, they'll, yeah they'll so be you don't care. <laughs> but when you look back, when you yeah. were a junior, yeah. oh well, for me, thinking about staying late, I think about being in AP classes that are heavily <coughs> dominated by seniors, and I think about after they've left, after they've already graduated, you have that period where it's just underclassmen sitting in a classroom for a month where the class is basically over and it's basically just teachers trying to figure a way to fill that time by like watching movies and doing all this other random stuff and I know it's kind of a group consensus that no one's going to be there and you're going to try to find a way to skip as many days as possible because you're kind of just I don't want to say it's a waste of time because it's school but you you've taken your final you're done with the class and it's just dragging on by that point by staying but till the 17th or 21st. And another thing is, I know, this is kind of just for kids, but I know Firefly, Firefly Music Festival next year starts the 18th. And I know kids already have their tickets and that kind of stuff done by Christmas of the year before. So I've heard kids talk about how they're just not gonna come those last days, which kids don't do anyways, but. I know you're not going to Firefly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would have to agree. We, I sat in t three out of my four classes this past year not doing anything for the last month of school, and I really can't imagine being in them any longer because, like Shannon said, we were watching movies and doing stuff like that. In one of my classes, it was only six of us left. So I think going any longer for at least high schoolers would not be the best thing. I don't know, like in elementary school, I don't know if I would have had that much of an opinion on when school ended, but for high schoolers, I, it definitely makes a difference going later. Not going later. Yeah, not, but like going later would, and I just can't even imagine how, I can't imagine what it would be like then. And you have a work schedule, so I'd Are your AP sometimes. classes, I mean, not, they're not over with, but what time do you stop learning in AP classes? In June, well, May or I see, times. if it's like heavily senior dominated, then by the time they've graduated, teachers usually have you take the final with them. In May. In, in May. April. I take my AP oh, finals in April, true. I know. So, so, so <laughs> being in school or not in school in June is irrelevant. Yeah. For a lot of AP classes, yeah. <laughs> And there are still some kids, though, who yeah, yeah. take well, their the freshmen, finals the last two the days freshmen, of school. Freshmen, sophomores, and juniors yeah. are still having instruction because right. their finals aren't until the last three days of school. Right. So they they have to be there. But, yeah. but do you want to be there June eight? You know, June twenty first? No, you want to have it done and over with. Okay, so we need a motion. Um, I would I am, would like a motion to remain with the current. And then if, if that doesn't pass, then we'll move to another motion. So right now, remain with the current approved as of May 1st calendar. Do I have a motion for that? I, I, can I amend that? Yes. Just to be, to be, to clarify. Okay. I make a motion to approve the approved calendar of May 1st, 2019 for the 2020-2021 school year. There you go. That's my motion. Second. Okay. Motion is second to approve the okay. current approved on May the 1st calendar for the 2020-2021 school calendar year. Maybe mention the start and end date. Pardon? Maybe mention the start and end date starting no. school on. No, it's yeah, just so it's already you're not changing it. Just so people are clear. So, all in favor, Mrs. Wright? Will I please read this by when your name is called? Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Ms. Winsett? Yes. Mrs. Carlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? No. I am for the affirmative. Okay. So, we'll remain with this calendar, but it is important for the public to know that we will Thank look you. very carefully at 
every calendar after this, and this is an unusually late one that we made our decision on, that doesn't mean every one after this is going to be that way. And we'll make every effort we can to have the calendar after Labor Day based on the input from the public. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the calendar committee continues to work, and they will be presenting the 21-22 calendar, because we'd like to stay two years uh, um, in advance. Um, within the next several months, right after uh, the new year, soon after the new year. And I would say to earlier, people can have the input, mm -hmm. the better job we can do by getting one that's hopefully suitable for everybody. Yep. I want to reiterate the fact that the, this is the l latest time that this the school year will start. That's correct, and it will and, circle back. And it will circle back the, the next year, and starting before Labor Day would be on the 20. 21, no, 21, 22 Correct. calendar would be a better time to start at, start before, I mean, after Labor Day. But this one, it just didn't make sense to and, us. And as, so, as we, us. we will make certain that we have both a pre and a post uh, for your, for your um, viewing and for you to vote on. Thank, Thank you great. very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you. you Ms. Bass, Ms. Forbes. <coughs> Okay, the next item is the Human Resources and Substitute Bus Driver Report. I will ask for a motion to approve it. As presented in closed session, so moved. Second. All in favor? Mrs. Aye. Wright. Will members speak at this time when your name is called? Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Next item is the interim human resources director contract. Um, we discussed in closed session and um, what we'd like to do, and I, I need a motion to approve the extension of the interim human resources director contract to go till December the 5th. On or before? Pardon? To extend the interim director contract on or before December 5th, 2020. So moved. On or before December 5th, 2019. I'm sorry, 2019. Okay, we'll start over. Mm -hmm. Pardon? Yes. Sorry, talked over. She did. Okay, let me repeat the... Uh, Thank you. The motion. The motion is to approve the extension of the Interim Human Resources Director contract to end on or before December 5th, 2019. So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor, Mrs. Wright. Well, members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morissette? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay, policies. Policy for second read. Mr. Fister? Yeah, before you tonight is the procurement for goods and services policy um, that's been out for public comment, and I don't believe we've received any public comment. It's uh, for your second reading approval. Okay, I had one question on that, Mr. Pfister. Yes, ma'am. Sorry to bring it up this late in the process. On the uh, page three under elements, uh -huh. it talks about below 25,000, and look under Roman numeral four, I two, it says the principal can approve 2,500 or less. Correct. On the regulation, page three, Roman numeral eight, B two, it gives the principal approval at 25,000 or less. And so I'm confused, it's 2,500. It would be 2,500. I'm, I'm sorry, I, ca I caught I2 on page three. Where was the other reference? The regulation. Page. Regulation, uh, Roman numeral eight, okay. B2. I just caught it when I read this again. I didn't catch it before. It reads, essentially, he can approve things under 25,000. No, the way I read this is uh, for for contracts below the solicitation threshold of twenty five thousand dollars. Superintendent will approve. Okay, you want to add twenty five hundred dollars there. I see what you're saying. Yeah, it it is confusing. It, yeah, it it, it, it is. It was not that intent. The intent was that that would if it wasn't if it was below the principal would be able to approve all of the contracts referencing back to the policy that the only contract they could approve was $2,500 or less. I don't know if it needs to be it reiterated in both the policy and the regulation. Maybe it does since I'm 
confused on it and okay. the principal yeah, might, yeah. might think that she or he has the ability to do it under 25. Could we just add one little piece in there that sure. is still 2,500 is? Okay. Mr. Vister, I also know that in the policy element C, it says the solicitation threshold that prompts a formal procurement shall equal the greater of 25,000 or the amount established in Maryland and dated code. I don't remember us agreeing to that. Where are you, Tammy? I'm sorry. Policy elements number uh -huh. four. Page three. Yeah, five. Section five. Oh, page, page five. five. Yeah, I don't remember us. Ms. Harper, I'll, I'll amend that. What I what, during our discussion, we talked about the fifty being just changed to twenty-five. But now that I reread this entirely, it should just stay at twenty-five thousand dollars and remove the last bit of that sentence. Thank you. You're welcome. So approval of all contracts. Okay, down a little further for contracts below solicitation threshold. Approval of all contracts using school activity funds, twenty-five hundred or less, will be made by the school principals. Is that what you were talking about? Right. She, Ms. Yeah. Captain Kelly referenced it. Um, oh, in the regulation. The regulation it's different. different. Yeah. It okay, thank It doesn't you. have 2,500 in that right. statement in the okay. regulation. Okay. But I, I can certainly add that. Okay, if you Thank would. you. And with those changes, I need a motion to move it to the third and final read. <coughs> so Second read. I'm sorry. Second read. So moved. Second. Okay, I have a motion to send the Procurement for Goods and Services um, Policy and Regulation 310.1 with amendments out to a second read. Well, this is this is the second read, isn't it? No, no. this is going out to second read. Going out to second this read. Is no, and we come back the next time it will be approved. Then we'll follow. We'll, we'll, we'll this is on. the second time we've seen it. Second now the public's going to see it as a second time. Yes. Yes. And then you. when I'm it comes back, it's all been reviewed twice gotcha. by everyone. So do I have a second to that motion? Yes. Second. Yes. Okay, all in favor, Mrs. Wright. Board members, please respond to the name of the call. Captain Kelly? Yes. Ms. Harper? Yes. Ms. Morissette? Yes. Ms. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay, 8.06 policies and regulations to repeal. President Captain Kelly, uh, action item 8.06 policies and regulations to appeal as part of the um, superintendent's purview to review existing policies for repeal. We are recommending the following six policies that are before you uh, go out for public read. Per the policy, they are to go out for two reads, uh, for two public meetings. Uh, the six of those policies are there. They have been reviewed by the policy committee and are recommended to you as well. I'm sorry, we have to send them out to be for, for first and second reads? Yes. I, to be repealed? Uh, correct. Okay. So it's in it's in policy development. I double check that. It's on okay. page three of the policy okay. that for review, uh, revision, or um, to be repealed, they have to go to two public meetings. For any feedback and we'll monitor those uh, at our next board meeting and provide you with any feedback you also see that per those designated departments there is some explanation as to why we'd like to uh, repeal that policy where, where do we find that it's right it's here. within uh, uh, the it's document right itself now. mr smith mm -hmm. it's being covered under other things these are just old policies i just want to find out why we're changing it where do i go there well, it's in the, sure. in the it's, same it's chart it's very it's very explaining why here and then you also have hyperlinked in there the existing policy so you can see the date um, in which and the actual language. Um, well, maybe just a simple thing, flag display. What, what, what are we changing? So I can understand. It's already covered under an annotated We're not code. changing we're it. We're, we're, we're getting rid of this one because it's covered somewhere, somewhere else. else. Yes. So like you're in 1993, I think it was, they came out with a ton of policies. And I know that's a good year because that's you, you graduated high school. But <laughs> they came out with a lot of policies that are currently covered under like our athletic handbook now and those, um, like the Maryland Center for School Safety has the fire drills. Back then, th we didn't have those, um, those uh, handouts and documents and all, but now we do. So it's kind of redundant to have um, when it's already stated in another We're really location. not changing policies as much as we're just addressing them in another area. Yep. That's correct. They've yes, already sir. been addressed. They've already. been addressed in another area. Yes, sir. Just cleaning up the policy log, backlog. Right. Yeah. Okay. Huge backlog. Any other questions? I make a motion to send the um, 
suggested policies and regulations to be repealed for first read. Not for a first read. Thank you. Do you have a second? Second. The motion is second to send the policies and regulations to repeal out for the first read. Mrs. Wright. Board members, please inform me your name is called. Captain Kelly. Yes. Mr. Harper. Yes. Mr. Morset. Yes. Mrs. Harlow. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. We have three field trips, um, the Kent Island High School varsity cheerleaders to a national championship, the Kent Island High School lacrosse to Chestnut Ridge Camp and Resort Center, and the Kent Island High School bands to perform in the Smoky Mountains Music Festival. I'd like to use all three of them in one motion, if you all, unless you all have some questions on them. Any questions on those three field trips? I just looked at them, some of them are costly. But they're all, they're not funded by this board. They're funded by boosters and private fundraisers. Fundraiser. Correct. And they'll make sure that all the students, anyone who can't afford it, gets, gets, gets assistance. Gets assistance. It. But it's not coming out of our budget. Uh -huh. It's coming out of a supplement budget that bu the boosters or fundraisers, or fundraisers do. Mm -hmm. Okay, I need a motion to approve the three field trips as I stated. So moved. Second. Okay. A motion and a second to approve the three Ken Island High School field trips. This is right. Board members, please respond when your name is called. Captain Kelly? Yes. Mrs. Harper? Yes. Mrs. Morset? Yes. Mrs. Harlow? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. I have five in the affirmative. Motion carries. Okay. Thank you. Next thing is transfer notice. Well, we don't have any transfer notices. It's a placeholder, correct? It, it is a placeholder, but just for the record, there are no transfers for the month gotcha. of October. Thank you. Sorry. Um, now, expenditure report. Thank you, Captain Kelly. Board members, before you is the standard expenditure status report, both a summary and detail by category. Um, everything is, seems to be okay. We are monitoring heavily the special ed education category. Um, as you can see, we have a balance of $3,000 there. Um, so we will, I'm going to do an in-depth analysis of that and make sure that everything in there is encumbered properly. As you can see from the detailed report, what's driving that shortage, it's not an overage yet, it's a shortage, is the increase in our non-public placements for the year and also the, our um, contract with the Midshore Special Ed Consortium uh, that had handed us about $112,000 increase over the current budgeted amounts for this fiscal year, and that's what's driving that. Everything else and all the other categories seem to be falling right in line with where we would expect it for this time of the year. So I present this for your information. And, and I see on special ed transfers, we're 134 percent over, but that's only because we've transferred but they're all, it's all committed for what you told us earlier. Yes, those two, so those two, the non-publics and also when we do a purchase order to one of the non-publics or to okay. special ed, it's in that encumbrance column, so it's the money's obligated, right. so, which is what's causing the overage, yes. If we were doing, as we learned a little bit tonight about the process of accounting, if we were doing a cash accounting, sort of like what we do with our own checking accounts, you wouldn't see that negative number, but we're anticipating that by June 30th, that's what the total cost will be. So you say you're going to do a deep dive. What does yes. that mean? Yes, ma'am. So what we're going to do is we're going to look in just to make sure that everything that's being reflected here, especially with the non-public transfers as you've approved, that there there's always could be adjustments to that. A student could be in a new non-public. They could leave. They could be transferred. So we'll be working with special ed because as we're getting down to this number down near zero, I want to make sure that that is an accurate number. I I'm pretty confident that it is. I just want to go down into it a little bit further just to make sure that we're presenting you with the most accurate information we have at this time. So what do we do about the negative? What's so the if we do anticipate, I do anticipate a negative as we go forward, when then we would look to other places in the budget that we would transfer those funds from. That could be administration, it could be the instructional salaries. Um, you know, we've already done a transfer in category within special ed itself because of the contracted versus salary issue. And we'll look at that in other areas as well, just to make sure that we're all where we need to be, but for right now, we would have to find this money from somewhere else within the budget <coughs> to fund this overage. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a commitment we know we got for the next yes. year, but this is our one that's a pro 
not a problem. It's an issue that we know we. It's an issue. Hopefully, it's only a one one year issue. Um, but I'm sure with uh, we we see variants over the last couple of years as we've talked in budget discussions with um, you know the five year trend that we've seen and in non public self of we've seen ups and downs. So maybe this is just an up year. You know, so we don't want to react too adversely by throwing a bunch of money in this budget. But you know, we want to be cautious. But we probably will need to supplement this funding, especially with the Midshore Special Ed Consortium, if we continue to be a, a, a member of that. Because those costs are continuing to go up, like our own special ed costs. And we're looking at the cost value for that, if we should stay involved with that. Yes. Yes, we are. And I believe Dr. Uh, Kane has already had started some conversations in that regard. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next thing is community participation. Public comment, everyone. <coughs> All right. So future school board meetings, uh, November 20th is a work session from 5 to 8. In that work session, we will work on, uh, hopefully get finished with the appeals guide, and then we'll continue our discussions on the budget, budget items. Continue where we left off, mm -hmm. going over the budget items. At the next work session? Next work session. Do we have policy on there? Pardon? Do we have ethics policy on there? Um, I think we were, session. yeah, you talked about that at your, but the question was, are we going to include the ethics policy at the next work session? Right. And the answer was yes, we were going to do that. Correct, Mr. P? Yes, we met with the policy committee yesterday and they made some recommendations. So uh, we're in the process of making those revisions. So if that's the will to put it on the uh, agenda, we'll have it ready for its first read uh, at the next okay. November meeting. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes. Then December 4th is our next school regular school board meeting. Does anyone have anything else they want? Okay, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, meetings adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.